The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. My name is Adam Epstein. Um, I'm chairing today's discussion. The discussion today relates to the issues that you and your business need to consider about self-reporting to regulators. Let me introduce you to our panellists. So the first panellist is um, a guest from outside, uh, from the ICO, uh, is Laura Middleton. She's the group manager for the ICO's personal data breach service. And then in terms of the Mishcon folk we have here, John Baines. John is a senior data protection specialist here. Nikki is um, a partner in our betting and gaming group. And finally, I should probably tell you who I am. Um, I'm a partner here. Uh, I run the regulatory group and my particular expertise in, is in dealing what we call uh, distressed actions with the regulators. So any kind of tricky situations that people have. So let me start the discussion by just telling you a little bit about what we mean by self-reporting. Uh, because obviously there's um, there's all kinds of reporting that the folk have to do um, in the regulated sectors, you know, annual reports or transaction reports. We're not talking about that kind of reporting here. The self-reporting we're talking about here is effectively when you're having to um, confess to the regulator that you've done something wrong or there's been um, some kind of a breach in order to give people a sense of where everyone's coming from it would make sense to just start with a little bit of context. So, Nikki, can you just tell us a little bit about what the um, Gambling Commission requires by a way of self-reporting? The requirements for businesses licensed by the Gambling Commission kind of fall into two categories. There are a number of specific um, reporting requirements, and then there are some more sort of general overriding principles. Um, and on the sort of more specific side, um, most of the time we're looking at things um, that require um, notifications to be made by, to the regulator, and those are known as key events. And broadly speaking, those are events that could have a significant impact on the nature or structure of the business. As I mentioned, there's a number of other sort of specific notification requirements under the license, which would include a breach of the license conditions themselves or the social responsibility code provisions of the ALCCP. But as I say, there are also some overriding disclosure requirements, which are more relevant to this discussion in particular, the Gambling Commission expects licensees to work in an open cooperative way and to disclose to it anything which the Gambling Commission could reasonably expect to know. And there's a sem similar expectation that's actually set out in the LCCP, which includes anything that's likely to have a material impact on the licensee's business or its ability to conduct its activities compliantly. So those are the kind of situations where a number of different and sometimes competing factors will come into play. So, Laura, can you tell us um, what the requirements are for self-reporting uh, and why the ICO regards um, those requirements as being important? So there's a legal requirement to report certain personal data breaches to the ICO, so it's, it's not optional. By personal data breach, we mean a breach of security leading to, amongst other things, the accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, disclosure, access to personal data. So it isn't every time you might fail to comply with the, the UK GDPR. Why it's important is by telling the ICO that you've had a breach, you allow us the opportunity to provide you with advice and guidance at that really early stage. If we know about the breach, then it helps us kind of manage complaints and inquiries from people who might be affected. We use the information that we get from data breach reports to look for trends. So, uh, for example, we might look at particular sectors to see what the, the common breach types are in those sectors. And then we try and use those trends to turn that into advice and guidance. I thought I'd bring in one of our competition partners, and as if by magic, here he is, uh, Neil Bayliss. And if you, if you could just explain to the audience how it is that self-reporting works in competition and how that obviously contrasts a bit, and you can see a different impetus for that and for the other regulators. Yeah, so as you know, uh, I think, Adam, the CMA is the uh, UK regulator for competition and much consumer law as well. There's no mandatory um, reporter requirement as such. What there is, however, is a very generous uh, leniency program encouraged, which encourages people to come forward if they have been a participant in a cartel. The law allows them to come forward to the CMA 
um, fully disclose what they've done and participate in the investigation with the CMA is certainly better than the potential of a 10% of global turnover fine. Okay, all right, thanks so much for that, Neil. But so what I really want to explore is the different elements that can go into um, decision-making that, that um, organisations may have about whether to self-report or not. And one element, quite realistically of that, of the calculus that, that, that people make is are the regulators going to find out anyway? There's an obvious benefit, isn't there, to making a virtue out of it. Um, and that, I think, probably comes up a reasonable amount in data, which is why I wanted to ask John. The advent of GDPR did a few things. Um, uh, and, and one thing it did do was, was raise the uh, awareness of the general public around the issues of data protection. And what we see now is that... Um, increasingly the media and i'd include social media in that um pick up quite quickly on issues that that might be data breaches so what what we have found with some clients is while they are internally um, just becoming aware of an issue um already the media are starting to run with it i think this raises quite interesting issues issues for for controllers as to whether they need to notify the ico effectively you you only have to notify those breaches where there is likely to be a risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons and and that and that test that threshold is is not always a straightforward to test so the question may be should we make this notification anyway e even if the threshold might not be met do we make a notification because at least we are in in some respects controlling the the information flow laura how about if somebody decided they took the decision not to report but the regulator then found out about it and took a different view what would the ICO, what are the consequences of a failure to report if you, the ICO, think a report should have been made? We do expect um, organisations when we're carrying out an investigation to be open with us. And so it's possible that um, if we decided to move to a sanction, that we would sort of take the fact that we found out about a breach in a way that wasn't from a direct self-report, that we would take it into account there. Or perhaps if we were taking action for um, the breach of security itself, so your failure to have some sort of control or measure in place to prevent the breach from happening in the first place, we might then, you know, almost like add an additional line to that sanction about the failure to report. Can we can we just think about maybe what some of the more positive reasons for reporting might be? I mean, one of the things that we've touched on already is this idea of being open and cooperative with your regulator. And um, so one of the main advantages of self-reporting is that you avoid that criticism. Um, but there are some other sort of key advantages that I think are relevant to the decision making. Um, and critically, or one of the key advantages is, is controlling that narrative and, and the flow of information. You know, a carefully crafted notification provides the regulator with enough information to be able to properly understand and assess the issue. You can also use it as an opportunity to try and forestall any questions that the regulator might have. And the benefit of that is that if you provide too little information or they are bombarded with too much information, you know, the regulator might not quite be able to make head or tail of, of, of what's happening and take a more sort of scattergun approach in response in a bid to find out the information it needs. Ultimately, the regulator is interested in, you know, working out whether there's been a breach of a regulatory obligation or if there's an ongoing risk of um, to the licensing objectives or, or harm or risk to, to consumers. And by controlling that narrative, you can assure the regulator that you are continuing to take steps that are necessary to address those particular risks and minimise harm. Um, but I think one of the other advantages that's worth sort of touching on is the fact that if regulatory action does follow and there is a payment in lieu of a financial penalty made as part of a regulatory settlement, the Gambling Commission will take account of any early and voluntary disclosures that have been made. So those are the kind of some of the positive reasons for, for why you might report. Uh, the reasons why people uh, might not want to report, I guess, in some senses, are very obvious. What I wanted to think about, actually, um, is maybe some of the less obvious risks. Um, and I know that John, from his work, has 
I've got a, got a good sense of um, other risks that may be less obvious to people. A personal data breach, as defined in Article 412 of the UK GDPR, um, is a neutral thing. And you should still notify this neutral event to, to the ICO. And I, and I mentioned that just because the, the, there is certainly with, with, with personal data breaches that, that go public, even though it doesn't, if you like, constitute any concession of fault on, on your part, what we increasingly see is, is what the, the phrase I keep coming back to, the long tail of a data breach. Um, and, and that really con consists of potentially a regulatory investigation, but also complaints and increasingly claims or, or, or letters before claim, menacing letters coming in. And the solicitors take the view, the, the law firms, that this, this happened, therefore you must be at fault, therefore we're going to threaten you with, with legal action. Are there circumstances in which an organisation might notify um, a, a data incident or breach to you, and you then effectively lean on the organisation to contact its customers to make sure that they can be made good or people can make claims. There is a requirement to um, notify data subjects in certain circumstances. So uh, that is where the risk to those data subjects is considered to be a high risk. So it's a higher risk than reporting to the ICO to start with. So if we thought we were in that territory, then we could be that we would be encouraging the organisation right. to contact the affected data subjects. And um, if that wasn't done voluntarily, then we have powers to compel the organisation to inform those data subjects. On the subject of complaints, I would almost say I can I can see that we were talking about maybe some of those breach reports. Um, that are made that don't meet the threshold. I think sometimes um, organisations almost like to get ahead of a complaint um, and make their notification to the ICO first, even if they're not strictly required to do so, almost because they're kind of seeing how these might play out with individuals in the future. And they're thinking, oh, well, almost like if we come to the ICO, then we can show that, you know, we're, we're being open and honest. Making that notification to the ICO doesn't necessarily kind of absolve you of dealing with those complaints. So if the ICO's view is, as John said, or we can kind of, you've explained how this has happened and we can see how that's happened and we don't think there's an, an underlying issue that's led to this breach occurring. So from our point of view, there's nothing more for you to do. That kind of doesn't get round dealing with that complaint and you might still have those complaints to deal with at a it's a later stage. So what I'd like to talk about now is um, making sure that you as an organisation are in a position to recognise when you actually need to self-report. And I know Nikki's got um, uh, a few things to say about um, training uh, and ensuring that people know what needs to be self-reported. Put simply, you know, training is an imperative part of ensuring that there's a general awareness within the business of, of the licensee's obligations um, to, to report and, and ensuring that that training extends beyond your sort of compliance teams. Um, you know, often we see businesses with very good training materials in place, but they just aren't delivered to, to the people on the ground. In regulation, there has been a, a real direction of travel over the last few years towards personal accountability. If I could just ask really quickly, um, first Nikki and then John, how they see um, accountability playing out in betting and gaming and in data where it's less obviously developed at the moment. You know, as you say, there's that same expectations of people in senior positions and personal management holders, license holders, as it does of, of the licensee, the corporate entity. Um, it expects those people to disclose anything to the Gambling Commission that it would reasonably expect to know. It expects them to be open and cooperative. Um, and what we've seen, and certainly in the last couple of years, is that where the corporate entity has its licence reviewed, um, it's increasingly common for the personal management licence holders to have their PMLs reviewed um, as well as a sort of follow on to the, the main licence review. John, it works somewhat differently doesn't it in data the data for protection framework works on the basis that the legal person that's accountable is the organization the company and i just stress some people sometimes think 
oh, well, if there's a data protection officer, then it must be them who's accountable. And I think it's crucial to say that's that's neither the role nor the, nor the responsibility of a DPO to to take everything on their shoulders. They 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 effectively perform an advisory role within an organisation. In uh, in a number of situations, there might be a number of different regulators. So there could be different regulators domestically, or there could be um, different regulators. Um, internationally, and that might impact how people decide to deal with self-reporting issues. Do you want to just, just tell us a little bit about that? So the UK, as, as I guess everyone knows, is, is no longer part of the EU. We're now subject, companies, controllers in the UK are subject to the UK GDPR. Uh, the EU GDPR carries on regardless in, in, in the rest of Europe. And and what that creates is, is a slightly problematic position for for companies who are operating in the UK and in European countries, in that when it was all one one thing, one EU and, and one GDPR, there was the concept of a lead supervisory authority. With the UK out of the EU now, there is a risk that you're actually, the, the, the lead supervisory authority concept falls away for UK controllers. And if you're operating in European countries, you may find yourself having to make notifications to regulators in all of those countries and potentially be subject to regulatory investigations in all of those. So that, that's a long answer for, to say it, it's complicated. Thank you to, to all of you. And what I hope that people can take from it is um, that these are things that don't only apply to the particular uh, regulated sectors that we're talking about, but that can apply across the board. Um, and really, I just want to say thank you very much, and we hope to see you at our future events or digital sessions. The Mishcon Academy Digital Sessions. To access advice for businesses that is regularly updated, please visit mishcon.com.